Good afternoon and welcome to the full annual Thomas and Salma Hyder Biomedical Breakthrough Lecture. I would like to recognize the planning committee for this event. Dr. Thomas and Salma Hyder, generous donors and supporters of the School of Medicine mission. Dr. David Lowe, Senior Associate Dean for Research and Distinguished Professor of Biomedical Sciences. Dr. Monica Carson, Chair of the Division of Biomedical Sciences, Professor of Biomedical Sciences, and the S. Sue Johnson Presidential Endowed Chair. Dr. Emma Simmons, the Salma Hyder Endowed Chair for the Thomas Hyder Program. Senior Associate Dean for Student Affairs. Edna Johannes, Executive Director, as well as the development team. Linda Ryman, Chief of Staff and Assistant Dean, as well as the Strategic Initiative team. I would especially like to recognize Dr. Emma Simmons, Senior Associate Dean of Student Affairs, who is joining us tonight as the Salma Hyder Endowed Chair for the Thomas Hyder Program. A special thanks to Tom and Salma Hyder for having the vision to create and support this event. We would not be here tonight without their ongoing support from the very beginnings of the School of Medicine. This afternoon, we are fortunate to have Dr. Stanley Chi joining us to present on the synthetic genome engineering for genomics and therapeutics. Dr. Chi's lab combines synthetic biology with genome engineering to understand the function of mammalian genomes and develop gene therapy. Based on my brief meeting with Dr. Chi this afternoon, I can assure you that you will enjoy this excellent lecture highlighting some remarkable possibilities in genome engineering. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas Hyder, a world-renowned spine surgeon, philanthropist, entrepreneur, and inventor. He has been a driving force behind the creation of UCR School of Medicine. Dr. Hyder established the Thomas Hyder Program at UC Riverside School of Medicine, which provides an avenue for qualified and culturally diverse students to enroll in UCR School of Medicine each year. This program stems from the earlier UCR, UCLA, Thomas Hyder Program in Biomedical Sciences, part of the branch campus of UCLA Medical School, where students completed their first two years of medical school at UCR before entering UCLA for their clinical years and graduating with the medical doctor degree from UCLA. Dr. Hyder is a recipient of the UC Riverside Chancellor's Medal of Honor, the American Medical Association's Pride in the Profession Award, and he was awarded the Outstanding Medical Profession of the Year Award by the United States Congress. He has developed and patented significant medical instrumentation that is used in spine surgery throughout the country. He is a founding member of the American College of Spine Surgery. And Tom and his wife Salma created and operate the Children's Spine Foundation through which they provide free medical care 
to children at their clinic, the Hyder Spine Center, as well as in hospitals abroad. Dr. Hyder has authored numerous medical publications and was appointed by the governor of California to the Medical Board of California and later to the State Bar Board of Governors. He is currently serving as Associate Clinical Professor at UCR School of Medicine, as well as Clinical Professor at the UCLA School of Medicine. Without further ado, Dr. Thomas Heider. Thank you, Dr. Dees. This is a great evening. I did have a chance to doctor, talk to Dr. Chi earlier today, and it was a great conversation. I would like to begin by thanking our Chancellor Wilcox for making all of this possible. And then special thanks to Dr. Deborah Dees, Dean of the School of Medicine. She has provided this opportunity and the, and the mechanism to have these lectures, to present our campus to the, our, our vis visiting professors and also bring these great lectures to the UCR community and also Riverside. I also would like to thank our planning committee, Dr. David Lowe, Dr. Monica Carson, Edna Johannes. They have put countless hours planning for this lecture and it really wouldn't be in the shape and form it is now without their help and their guidance. I'm especially honored to introduce Dr. Stanley Chi. Dr. Chi got his bachelor's degree in physics from Tsinghua University in China. He got his master's in physics from UC Berkeley, and then he went on to get his PhD in a combined program with UC Berkeley and UCSF. His PhD was in bioengineering with emphasis on genetic engineering. His advisors were Dr. Adam Arkins and Jennifer Doudna. As most of you may know, Dr. Doudna was awarded the Nobel Prize last year for chemistry. Dr. Chi has been an assistant professor at Stanford University since 2014. And again, working on genetic engineering. And he has accomplished quite a bit in the past six, seven years that he has been in Stanford. And obviously way before that in his uh, graduate education at uh, Berkeley. He has developed the multiplex CRISPR for gene regulation and editing. He has also developed CRISPR for live cell imaging and also CRISPR as antiviral for COVID-19. That one is called Pac-Man, very appropriate name. Dr. Chi has been involved in over 70 publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals. He has numerous patents, six of which I saw that's already issued and 12 that are in provisional status. A lot of his patents revolve around the CRISPR technology and genetic engineering. He has received numerous awards, including Director Early Independence Award from NIH, Career Award from National Science Foundation, and Technology Review 35 Innovators Under 35 from MIT. We're so honored to have him here he, his lecture is going to be fascinating. Uh, the, the possibilities with genetic engineering that he's involved with uh, can solve problems with diabetes, blindness, 
and even fountain of youth, who knows? But uh, please join me in welcoming, doc welcoming Dr. Stanley Chi. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Thomas Heiner. And thank you so much for the, your generosity in su supporting the medical education and the research. Uh, it's a true honor really for me to give this lecture. And uh, to be honest, I'm humbled to join such a brilliant group or audience and talk about our research. And, and today my topic is going to be on the synthetic genome engineering for genomics and therapeutics. As you have heard from Dr. Thomas uh, Heider's introduction, I was trained as a physicist and changed my path to become a synthetic biologist and a bioengineer. As a physicist, I was intrigued to learn about the small things, for example, the atoms, how they compose and constitute matter. And this type of curiosity drew me to think about the essence of life, DNA. Fundamental questions on DNA always puzzle me. For example, Shown here is a picture depicting the, what our human genome, how organized, how organized they are, and the questions around how they control our inheritance. What is the logic behind the life? And what caused a variant of the DNA cause disease? This is all largely unsolved. The human genome is a complete suit of genes and elements that control genes. And also it's a blueprint of life, if you don't mind me calling that. In the past decades, two transformative technologies have emerged to help us unveil its secrets. For example, sequencing. And we are sequencing. Scientists were able to sift through almost three billion base pairs of our genome to find clues that may have a role in our health and disease. Yet this was not enough. To build a causal relationship between the DNA and how the function, and, if, and also to possibly correct some mistakes in the DNA, genome engineering emerged. Many likened the genome engineering to a molecular scissor, like shown here. This is true. And as you have kept reading about some news, uh, in recent years. CRISPR is a specific type of um, molecular scissor. And in particular, it's a type of bacterial immunity to fight phages, appear as is such a precision molecule with tremendous power uh, on our genome DNA. And shown here is a three-dimensional depiction of the Cas9 enzyme and how it pairs with its RNA and binds to a double strand DNA. And this is actually how the molecule in the natural case used to find its foes, which are bacteriophages, plasmids that impose survival danger to the bacteria cells. And harnessing this fundamental mechanism, one single enzyme use a one single guide RNA to quickly search and cut DNA. In the past decade, we heard so many exciting development about the gene editing and the base editing. Shown here is uh, gene editing when the enzyme guided by RNA binds to a piece of DNA, it will have a precision cut on the DNA, which can be used to guide how this piece of DNA can be repaired to cause a correction of the mutation, as an example. And another branch goes to base editing by further recruiting an enzyme, for example, a adenosine deaminase, which can precisely mutate the adeno adenine into a guanine, so A2G mutation. All these are very exciting and have changed our way to modify DNA. Yet in my talk, I really want to put these exciting technologies in the context of the human genome engineering. As you can see, the human genome is not just a stack of letters, ATCG. It actually spans across a large spectrum from angstrom to more than 10 micrometers in the human nucleus. 
And gene editing and base editing technologies give it, uh, it us power to modify the nucleotides. With three billion base pairs in the human genome, since it's not just stacking ATCG, and there are also many other layers in the genome that requires regulation. And it's actually this huge scale of the organization grants the genome function that beyond our imagination. And I really like to emphasize the main point of the talk. The genome is not just a letter A, T, C, G in order. And in a similar sense, genome engineering is not just editing. It's actually exciting to see two decades of the epigenome research started to look into two large regions of the genome. One is the epigenome, meaning the chemical modifications on the DNA, such as DNA methylation. The second is a three-dimensional genome organization, including enhancer-promoter interaction and how the chromosome form territories. How can we engineer these layers to understand how they play a role in disease and also correct that if something goes wrong? And that's the question that I'm going to talk about in the next session. So here's the general outline of the talk. First, I'm going to talk about how to develop genome engineering toolbox. And our goal here is to expand beyond editing. And the second is how can we use synthetic biology and genome engineering tools for enabling new type of gene therapy. And finally, amid this pandemic, I'd like to share our new method and the thoughts about how we can further develop CRISPR as the antiviral to target not only a single virus, but a broad spectrum of RNA viruses. And the first topic is about how we can develop a genome engineering toolbox beyond editing. As you see, a CRISPR is a molecular scissor. And the main focus here is how to turn a pair of scissors into something that can be a regulator. In 2013, uh, our lab was first to turn the Cas9 nucleus into a nucleus dead molecule termed DCAS9. And shown here is we broke the scissors, and this was the beginning of the journey for many RNA-guided uh, applications later. And we generally call it DCAS, stand for dead. But what is that? If nucleus is dead. And the concept applies to many RNA-guided DNA targeting applications. As you see that the Cas9 is a multi-domain molecule, and it has two nucleus domains that can specifically cut DNA upon binding to the DNA molecule. And the first step to generate a nucleus dead Cas, so it doesn't cut but still bind, is to mutate these two nucleus domains out. And that was exactly what we did. Of course, there's always a question. If we modify a protein, it may destroy it. And to verify that removing the nucleus functions of the Cas9 and it's still a useful molecule to bind to DNA and guide it by RNA, we performed a series experiment. And to our pleasure, when we test that DCAS system with the nucleus domain knockout, we find it serves as a 20 base pair um, uh, system to find DNA, pretty much like what it naturally does but without a cutting. And it can target many genes and in many organisms. And I want to give you an overview of the system. And as we continue to work on the developing tools beyond editing, together with other labs, we were able to demonstrate a full family of tools that can be leveraged for RA-guided DNA targeting or RA targeting. The concept is using a specific DCAS protein DCAS9, DCAS12, DCAS13 shown here, paired with a cognate, target specific guide RNA. And they can together type, target any type of cell and then cause specific binding to DNA or to mRNA. And then the game starts. Then we start to think, oh, how can we not modify this piece of DNA, but still control the function out of it? And we have a series of development a big brief summary here is we were able to regulate transcription by turning on off genes, how they interact with RNA polymerase shown on in the first left side, 
and we were able to introduce desired uh, epigenome chemical modification, such as demethylation, into a chromatin. And we were able to modify how the DNA are organized inside the nucleus, their positioning and their and their and, and their location. And finally, we also showed this system can be turned into an imager. And a series of papers listed here. So in case you need any reference. I will do a brief introduction into these works just to give you a, a general picture how a single uh, bioengineering molecule can be used for so many different purposes. And I always like that to be a Swiss, a Swiss army knife. I think it's not a scissors. It's a, it, it actually can do many functions depending on your application. For example, we first developed a technology called CRISPR activation and CRISPR inhibition, stands for CRISPR A and CRISPR I. And the basic concept is not to cut DNA, but to target a specific piece of DNA and recruit a very specific type of effector. For example, shown here, it could be a transcriptional repressor or a transcriptional activator. Depending on which effector you recruited to the target gene, we can exert different types of function on this gene. And the bold data are usually the domain that shows very good e efficiency. For example, a CRAB domain has been used to silence a target gene on the transcriptional level. And another tripartite uh, inhibitor reported by other labs, VPR, can be used to strongly activate this gene. And with this, we essentially imagining, well, we can insert a lot of switches endogenously into the human genome. And by simply recruiting different effectors, we can turn on and turn off different fragments of the gene. And that should bring tremendous power of our engineering on the genome without changing this DNA sequence. And we, we are further intrigued by this multiplex capability. For example, the human genome is not only consists of one gene, Instead, there are tens of thousands of genes there. And it's usually the interplay between these genes that cause a function. And we think, oh, how can we activate and repress genes differently? So for example, published uh, in 2015, we developed a system to simultaneously activate a receptor gene and turn off another gene that has a function in the disease, just simply by uh, using an orthogonal pair of RNA binding proteins, which recruits either an activator or repressor. I'm not going to show further data, but please trust me, we were able to simultaneously activate many genes. And currently, we try to change that number, and, and, uh, and we can robustly turn on more than 10 genes in a single cell. i like to highlight, uh, besides transcription, this system is powerful for uh, epigenetics. So um, what is epigenetics? It means we are not we are rewriting the chromatin status by demethylation or by histone modifications. We are not modifying the regulation, but we are changing the timing on this regulation. And people call it epigenetic memory. For example, if you think about a transcriptional effector, what it does is to prevent the interaction between a RNA polymerase with DNA but that effect can be very trendy. When you have the effector, it turns, it turns off the transcription, but when you no longer have the effector, the transcription comes back. And compared to that, epigenetic modification have a persistent long-term effect because it not only excludes polymerase, but also it permanently changes the status of the DNA, so it no longer interacts with polymerase. And shown here is an example of how we can use a transcriptional repressor called DCAS9 CRAB by transiently introducing them into cells, we can turn off the cells. And it, rather than doing that, if we recruit three domains consisting of transcriptional effector and the two DNA transferase called DNMT3 and 3L, we, and even after this effector is decayed, we still see persistent repression, and this repression lasts for months. And in our experiment, we tested three months. It was a hard experiment for the student to perform it. And not only that, this type of demethylation, which caused the resilencing over a long time, can also be reversed by another epigenetic effector like acetyl transferase, P300, 
combined with the activator. And as, as well, we can see that after we apply in transiently the activator, we can permanently activate the genes. And this work was done by a postdoc, uh, Muniaki Nakamura, who continued to explore, well, a lot of phenotype in human cells, for example, differentiation, uh, cell fate commitment, and even aging are controlled by this such type of epigenetic switches. And how can we unravel their functions? These tools could be a useful system. With these additions, we are happy to see that CRISPR tools developed for transcriptional and epigen regulation. However, one remaining question is how can we control the three-dimensional DNA organization in cells? To fulfill this goal, we developed two technologies in recent years. One is called CRISPR genome organization for CRISPR, uh, CRIS CRISPR Go for perturbing how DNA are organized. And second is called live fish for live cell fluorescent in situ hybridization. And using these two methods, we can both perturb and virilize the organization of the DNA in human cells. A few years ago, a postdoc, Haifeng Wang, who is now assistant professor in Tsinghua University, asked, asked me how we can harness CRISPR for relocating DNA in the nucleus. She, uh, we conceived one design using a chemically induceable system called abscisic acid inducible PYL1 and ABI system. And further, we fuse the ABI to a DCAS9 molecule, which goes to the DNA site, and we fuse the PYL1 to another protein called amyrin, which is an integral protein of the membrane of our nucleus. And this is equivalent to uh, a male system. For example, DCAS9 now is like a dress label tagged to the DNA, and amyrin is like a destination to tell where this shipment should go. And adding the small molecule, we, we hypothesize this can bring the DNA locally to the nuclear membrane and the wash away, we will reverse the process. And this was indeed what we observed. And Hyphon tested the design on many chromosome sites, as you can see here, chromosome seven, X, the exist gene, very important gene, and the P10, uh, oncology gene. And in all cases, adding the inducer abscisic acid was able to recruit the target DNA to the nuclear membrane, while wash away the abscisic acid, uh, reverse that, and uh, mostly the DNA is inside the nucleus. I want to show you some images to convince you I didn't, I didn't cherry pick a few images just to, just to, just to like, uh, uh, show you it doesn't, it, it's not working robustly. Okay, so we actually tried methods to recruit the human telomeres. You know, telomeres are important control elements on the ends of our genome. And as we get older, the telomere gets shorter. But normally, they not in on the nuclear membrane, as you can see from this three-dimensional reconstruction, the telomeres on the flat cell, mostly inside the cells, but not on the surface labeled by green and telomeres in red. Okay, on the, in the second movie, i like to show you after adding the abscisic acid, most telomeres go to the envelope. As you can see from the two dimensional, they are on the edge, but some seem to be in the middle. But actually, if you look at from the three dimensional, they are either on the top or on the bottom. So it's really interesting to see most of these telomeres after using the CRISPR-Go recruitment can be recruited to the nuclear membrane. How many of them? Well, they are like every chromosome has two. They are more than, more than 100 because it's a, a aneuploid cell line, cancer cell. And we not only find that, we also find if we recruit telomeres to the nuclear membrane, we can dramatically reduce the cell proliferation. Keep in mind, these are cancer cells. They can grow very robustly, but seems if we put telomere in the a, in a, in a, in a wrong position, it's really like kill the cell, which is interesting and it would be interesting for future studies. And not only that, if we think about the human nucleus is a mansion, it has many, many rooms. And this is a beautiful picture, but depicting many compartments. And, and, uh, and, and there are a lot of questions remaining why the nuclear is so complicated. Why is that just not a soup? And for example, we further tested how the DNA can be recruited to, to other bodies circled here, like Kahal bodies, PML body, and the nuclear speckles. And we were able to recruit to many of them, but I'd like to highlight one particular compartment called the heterochromatin. 
for people who study the, the crumping, you know, DNA can be organized into two types of form. One is the open form called u crumping Another is the closed form called heterocrumpting. And the heterocrumpting is highlighted by this particular protein called HP1 alpha. HP stands for heterocrumpting protein. So this protein is super interesting. It has a particular organization. It has a, a chromo shadow domain. And also it has a, a, a lot of hinge ranges. So based on that, the chromo shadow domain can usually dimerize. And also the protein can also oligomerize via its hinge region. So consider this, it's not just a single protein. It can form a condensation if it's reach high enough number. So we actually use the CRISPR Go to recruit that uh, to DCAS9 to the DNA. What we did is we recruit a lot of copies of the HP1 alpha to the human chromatin tiled along a chromatin region. So we can make this protein reach about a certain threshold. And when we got that happened, we actually did see some very interesting thing because it started to mimic the hum natural human endogenous heterochromatin. A few in interesting behavior can be observed. For example, when we try to recruit this to two different chromatin regions separated by several hundred kilobases, and because this system can form a condensation, it can bring together the two DNA into one location. So it can modulate the DA-DNA interaction, even though these are far away. The second is when we try to recruit the synthetic heterochromatin on the target DNA, we find the nearby genes can be silenced. This is very consistent with the natural function of the heterochromatin, but we were surprised to see even genes that is half megabase away from the, from the target site were still suppressed. Um, the second function we saw is this uh, heterochromatin, synthetic heterochromatin can compact DNA. For example, this is a real microscope image. Naturally, the chromatin can look more diffused. After adding the small molecule, we start to condensate HP1 alpha on this piece of DNA and HPL alpha start to form an uh, aggregation and bring together this into a more compact form. And after we wash away this FCC acid, it's reversed back into its relaxed state. But the reversal process is much slower than the recruitment process, suggesting a memory that was created by this heterochromatin protein one alpha. Okay, as a last example, I, I want to point you a uh, uh, CRISPR as a chromatin imager. Um, so besides using that as a regulator, we use a, a CRISPR as a, as a labeler to look into how we can label DNA rather than act and rather than control them. We chemically synthesized a, a DNA and delivered Cas9 protein in a complex into the human cells. And here I want to mention one interesting observation, which is how do we know the guide RNA is very stable? Well, the guide RNA in cells is very unstable, to be honest. It's it only stable if it binds to the on target, but it can be very unstable if it's floating around without a target. So that actually inspired us to think, oh, well, this could be a bad news for editing because you cannot get a reach of high concentration, but this is good news for imaging because only the on target signal will persist while the off target signal will decay. And by calculating the signal to noise ratio, which is on target to off target, we actually saw this method can improve the, the, the ratio by more than tenfold. This further allowed us to perform very clear, very easy diagnostics on the aneuploid cells. For example, we got the, these patient samples uh, from normal patients, the amnoid, amniotic fluid cells, and this should be two copy, right? Sometimes four copy if cells dividing. And indeed, you can see how strong the signal to noise ratio is. And all, but when we take samples from the Patel syndrome, a rare disease which patient has three copies of the chromosome 13, we indeed saw uh, three copies. And keep in mind, this is not by fixing cells. This was performed in living cells. The samples were live tissues from the patients and can still be used for many other functional tests. And without further getting into it, um, uh, about imaging because I have more exciting story to share next. Uh, I'd like to give you a brief summary. 
And our work in the past years has been thinking how we can expand beyond editing. We focus on epigenome. We made several tools for transcription and epigenetic modifications. We also made some imaging tool and control tool to control the 3D genome. And we think these tools could be used in broadly to study the general picture of the genome and how that leads to more complex disease. The second part is, is our recent work and also some many unpublished work. The topic is to develop genome engineering, including regulation and editing towards in vivo research. I'm sure as a biomedical researcher here, many of you were curious how that could be and if whether like CRISPR is good. And in particular, we are interested in genetic, epigenetic type of gene therapy. And Forgive me if I'm too optimistic about the future of the genome engineering, which I called a, br a, a bright uh, blue sky, um, but there are definitely some clouds that shadows the sky. There are a few of them. I'm showing you two. One is how can we make CRISPR tools work in vivo? They are not as effective as usually like uh, shown for ex vivo, which actually already observed by many researchers and uh, expeditions. And the second is uh, current applications of CRISPR often oriented towards monogenic disease. And to our interest, we think, well, with great tools, there may be more applications that were not imagined before. How can we expand these therapeutics? And so, since a few years ago, we start to ask how to make genome engineering suitable for in vivo research. I'm going to give two examples and both recent works on how we address this bottleneck via bioengineering. The first example is to engineer a mini sized CRISPR, uh, uh, CRISPR system termed CASMINI. We try to address the payload size of the CRISPR, which is a major bottleneck in the the field of genome engineering. Mostly, mostly commonly used Cas9 or Cas12 family. I'm listing a few here. Uh, have sizes larger than a thousand amino acids. That is a fairly large protein, which is not uh, very helpful for, for using a clinically relevant adeno associated virus for delivery because AEV usually have limited payload size of 4.7 kb. And also, uh, with more and more applications of the mRNA and the lipid nanoparticle delivery, it's becoming clear that these LMPs deliver smaller payloads better. So it's an imperative to define CRISPR system that is as small as possible, yet as effective as possible. And to answer this question, Xiaoshu Xu, who is a postdoc in my lab, uh, start to look into this question. And she first looked at the gold standard gene editor named Cas9 here, as you see the st structure, which I also showed before. It's a large protein. It has 1,368 amino acids. And this size restricts it from easy delivery. In 2018, excitingly, Dr. Jennifer Donna's lab reported a characterization of a naturally occurring smaller CRISPR system at the moment they termed Cas14. And later, the system was also termed CAF12F from phylogenetic uh, profiling. And uh, it remains unclear what, uh, if this CAF14 system can be used for uh, gene editing in human cells. But just look at its size, 529 amino acids, which is more than half uh, uh, smaller right, than, than the CAF9. And more than that, intriguingly, like CAF9 is a single monomer binding to DNA, uh, Cas14 form a dimer and together they bind to a piece of DNA. That could also explain why its size is so small, yet it's still functional. But since it were not known if the system could work in human, we set out to test the system. So Xiaoshu first generated a nucleus data version following our previous rationale to see if we fuse this DCAS12F by mutating the nucleus domains to an activator. Can we really bind to DNA in human cell and activate an easy gene like a reporter GFP. And to our disappointment, it didn't work. As you see from the diagram with a non-targeting guide, no GFP, but with a targeting guide, we also saw 0% of cells could be activated. That seems to be insufficient for gene activation in human cells. It's known that many CRISPRs are evolved in bacterial context and when move them to the human context, they are not ready yet. 
if you think about that, it's actually quite reasonable because bacterial genome is a thousand times smaller than human genome. And evolution only evolve sufficient uh, function. They do not necessarily need to make them much better. So con conceivably, if we can improve their targeting ability by a thousand times, it should work. That's a, a simple math may not be the case, but, but it shows you how this may, uh, may become a rationale. So we think, okay, if evolution has not done this yet, can we, we are engineering to make that work. So first we turn our attention to the guide RNA and looking at this guide RNA secondary structure, we made a few changes. We eliminated some transcriptional terminators. We also modified at the interface between CRISPR RNA and the TRIS RNA. And to our pleasure, it worked and improved. But to our disappointment, it didn't work too well. The best one only showed 3.6 fold improvement. It's helpful, but not sufficient. Then we turn our attention to protein engineering. Similar rationale. This protein has not been evolved yet good enough to target human DNA. And human DNA has histones, a lot of structure, and we need to make them better. So to do this, you should look at the structure. And by the way, I want to mention that by that moment, when we work on this project, there was not yet a three-dimensional structure available. So what we did was we simulated using computational algorithms to predict what it might look like, how they might interact with DNA. And then we choose the amino acid within 1.5 nanometer distance, so fairly close to the DNA. And so they may interact with DNA. And furthermore, we made another hypothesis. To make this protein binding to DNA better, we need to increase the interaction by converting some uh, negatively charged amino acids into positively charged. Why? Because DNA is negatively charged. If we can make the protein more positively charged, it may enhance the interaction and make it more efficient and faster. That's indeed what we did. If you look at this big panel of the mutations, we indeed find uh, some mutations can dramatically uh, enhance um, the, uh, the activity. This was truly uh, rewarding. And in particular, a single mutation at the position uh, 143 was able to improve the efficiency by 123 fold. And many other mutations also have beneficial effects, suggesting the original hypothesis was correct, the protein was suboptimal, and we need human engineering to make them better. And furthermore, Xiaoshu combined these double, triple, quadruple mutations in multiple rounds. And for each round, she see uh, better and better mutants with better and better activation. And at the end of the uh, round four, you can see some mutants already start to show more than a thousand fold improvement over the original system, which was fully very exciting. Like I said, we need a thousand fold improvement, right? So questions is now how about the system work in human cells? We actually also compare that to uh, another wild type system, CAF12A. And when we uh, question uh, is uh, CAF12A is a good standard. And it actually known to be a very strong enzyme to activate. So, but it's much larger. It's actually two KB larger as shown here at the activator. And we choose them because CAF12A and the CAF mini share the same PAM sequence, which is called proto spacer adjacent motif, which is a sequence absolutely required for CAF molecule to bind. Then we can design a base pairing uh, guide RNA to bind to a nearby region so they can finally form a complex. As you can see from this data, when we try to activate a mammalian copy of GIP, the CAF mini outperformed CAF12A. We further tested on a few endogenous genes, and shown here uh, is interferon gamma and the human beta globin gene. And for each case, the, the magenta bars, the performance of the CAF12A uh, activator, and the blue bars is the performance of the CAF mini activator. And my conclusion is they are comparable which is good news. And you might also ask, well, you engineered a more efficient enzyme, but it may be less specific, right? That is a dilemma and a trade-off. And to verify it's still specific, we perform whole genome RNA sequencing in cells. We want to ask, besides the GIP gene, can we also non-specifically activate other genes as of targets? We don't want to see that. So we measured all the genes and compare a targeting guide to a non-targeting guide. On the left is CAF mini activator, on the right is CAF12 activator. You can see they are fairly comparable. 
And also this specificity is, to my experience, is very comparable to the DCAS9 systems. So our conclusion is, yeah, a specific is good. So the next question is, how about this system works for activation, uh, for gene editing? Given the Cas14 was really a new place, we asked whether Cas mini can be used for editing and whether it can overcome the, uh, the diff limitations of the wild type enzyme. We chose to mutate a few sites uh, guided by the uh, protein engineering, and we find using the improved system, we indeed can perform gene editing for, in, uh, for insertion, deletion, um, uh, uh, modifications called the indels on the, at different locations of the gene. And we also characterized what the uh, editing pattern. Um, we perform deep sequencing. And as you can see, some versions of the Cas mini showed a broader editing window on the target, which is useful for gene knockout. Um, the Cas mini editing window, uh, in my mind, is larger than Cas9, as you can see, uh, even as big as 20 bits per region, which is great news for knocking out a gene. And compared to that, Cas9 usually have one to two bits per of editing window. And uh, recent years, people are excited about the base editing as already uh, described briefly, which converts a single base pair. To test whether the Cas mini can be used for base editing, we fuse the DCAS mini to a pair of engineered adenosine deaminates reported by David Lu's lab from Harvard. The fusion system showed uh, if a uh, robust single base pair A2G mutation at different gen genes at different sites. And further, we characterized which window can allow base editing A2G, and we saw a very narrow window that allow that to happen. With the work on Cas mini is still going on as we try to demonstrate its use for in vivo applications. I'd like to show another example how we can combine bioengineering for in vivo applications. The project is to develop a novel gene therapy for retina regeneration. And Lucy Guo is an MD PhD a residence at, uh, here. And when she came to my lab, she asked me a question. Hey Stanley, can you, can your lab use your tools to treat some complex disease like glaucoma. And she was, uh, she's an ophthalmologist and cares about glaucoma, which is eye condition that damage optic nerves, usually caused by high pressure, but also is a leading cause of blindness for people over age of 60. And as people develop glaucoma, it's a progressive phenotype. So they start to see narrow and narrow and ultimately lose sight. And the concept here is since it's um, not a single gene disease, is due to a systemic problem. We need to turn on a few genes that are beneficial for the re, uh, neuron regeneration and uh, reprogramming. And so we need to choose a system to uh, activate multiple genes. And that was what she did. And she chose these three genes, OPT4, SAX2, and KL4. These are Yamanaka factor genes. And uh, biology told us if you turn on these genes, they are becoming more pluripotent. And the previous work showed retina can also reprogram better to generate more neurons. And then we generate, uh, uh, Lucy generated a single construct encoding a CRISPR array and a Cas12A and try to activate these three genes. Well, you might ask, why do you choose a Cas12A activator? Why not a Cas9 activator? The reason is Cas12A is a superb system to activate many genes by simply processing a long CRISPR array into smaller fragments, while Cas9 cannot do that at all. So what Lucy did was injecting this into the newborn mice after three weeks, harvest the retina, and try to see whether we can activate these three genes. And I'm not sure if you uh, uh, often read this uh, retina immunostaining. And from that staining, we can see the, the, all the cells. And the GIP is used as a marker for delivery into the different layers of the retina neurons. And the red color HA tag labels which cell actually can express the Cas12A system. And the KL4 is example for immunostaining the expression level of this gene. As you can see, they're very poor colocalization. We were disappointed by that. And not only KL4, but for other genes, ALT4 and SAS2, we see almost no colocalization. That suggests there is a big gap between in vitro and in vivo applications. A good standard CRISPR system that works very nicely in vitro may work poorly in vivo. How can we fill the gap? Again, we turn to protein engineering. Um, so for this system, um, 
we, we choose, again, similar as Casmini, we choose um, amino acids that is close to the DNA backbone within one nanometer. And also we mutate most uh, negatively charged uh, amino acid into positive charge to further enhance its activity. As you see, we choose this size. And uh, our hypothesis is by making a stronger protein, it may reduce the required molecular concentration. And we believe that is one of the limiting factor in vivo because we cannot deliver too many molecules in vivo into cells. And to our pleasure, the, this protein engineering was also rewarding. And really a lot of CRISPR system can be engineered, which is, a, which is very interesting. And uh, for example, one mutation can activate genes by 600 fold compared to a, a wild type system only shows 16 fold. And by combining them, we saw a more than 1900 fold activation. And this is more than 100 fold improvement. And Lucy likes this name, very good Castell A. That's what she called this uh, best mutant. And VG Castell, I don't know if you like it, but that's her favorite name. OK, so we further use this very good Castell to see, well, well, does that improve gene editing? And each mice has two eyes. And we inject a wild type cas 12 and also a, a VG cas 12 into each eye so we can rule out the genetic background. After the gene editing, we dissect the retina and the stain for the marker, particularly we look at this reporter in these trans, trans, uh, uh, transgenic mice. And we compared five mice side by side, left eye to right, to right eye. As you can see, the yellow bars show the editing efficiency for wild type and the blue bar show, show VG cas 12 And the lower expression means stronger gene knockout. So in all cases, the very good one outperformed the wild type. The next question, how can we activate three genes all together? Again, we use the same setup and as before. And now look at how we can activate uh, these genes. Look at HA gene here. Among the red cells, many of them also show staining for SARS-2. Co-localization. Not only that, it's also works for KL4 and ALT4. Very exciting. The engineered version works much, much better in vivo. And further, we look at what happens if we really activate SARS-2, ALT4, and uh, KL4. And when we compare this to controls, wild type system, which doesn't work, and another system called uh, enhanced cas 12 a developed by a different lab, we find a lot of new neurons regenerated inside the inner plexiform layer, and also the gang ganglion cell layer. As you know, these two layers are most important in talking to the brain to confer vision. So generating neurons there likely indicate there is a neuronal regeneration. And furthermore, we also showed if we only activate a single gene using the very good Cas12, we cannot trigger the similar phenotype. And the characterization shows when it's a VG Cas12, about 25% of average neurons were regenerated and migrated to this ganglion cell layer. With this, I'd like to summarize this part, which is why I find this exciting. Because first, in vivo research is hard, and mostly people focus on the single gene. And here, we find a system that can allow us to start in multi-genes. And it doesn't have gene damage because we turn gene activation. Of course, if you use active editing system, you can also modify genes permanently. And it has an easy delivery using either uh, AEV or in, vi in vivo or in vivo elaboration. And it may provide some solutions to starting more complex disease like glaucoma or uh, retinitis pigmentosa, but also may be applicable to other organs. I'd like to use the final uh, five minutes to talk about our uh, CRISPR antivirals for the broad spectrum RNA viruses. And I hope this will inspire some conversation. And also, uh, if you find it interesting, uh, there could be further collaboration. Our question into this is, can we develop a universal antiviral that targets thousands of viruses? Just for your reference, most vaccines or antivirals can only target a very limited number of viruses. So they are not universal enough. When we look at the coronavirus, I was surprised to see, wow, there are so many coronaviruses, and many of them infect animals. A few of them do infect humans. For example, besides SARS-CoV-2, we know SARS and MERS caused a big trouble for the human society in the past two decades. And there are also other viruses, 229E, 
and uh, OC43 cause cold sim uh, symptoms. It's very common, um, but it's there, right? They may evolve to become new dangers for us. But furthermore, we think uh, animal uh, uh, inhabiting virus may become infectious to humans someday, and we do need a, a method to quickly respond to emerging virus and also to counter the rapid evolution of the virus. To do this, a student named Tim C. Abbott started to tackle the question. He chose a specific CRISPR named Cas13, which is an RNA-guided RNA-targeting system, uh, and he imagined that could be a universal antiviral. And what does cas 13 do is it will use a guide RNA and then we are be pairing to find its target RNA and then cut it because it's an RNA. Uh, the cis protein is small, relatively small, not super small, um, but also fairly efficient and specific as shown by previous characterization. And, and Tim conceives the pipeline to be three steps. First, whenever there is an outbreak of the virus, in one day, we all know the sequence. And by bioinformatically aligning the sequence, we should know what sequence is concerned. And second is we predefine the, uh, we call PACMAN, stands for prophylactic uh, antiviral CRISPR. We predefine PACMAN compositions, is in particularly the guide RNAs that can bind to the highly conserved regions of the virus and quickly verify them using human patient samples like organelles. And then we use predefined molecules combined with medical device like a nebulizer. Let the patient inhale into the airway. And in that, the molecules could enter the, the, the respiratory cell layer and get rid of the virus and cause their degradation. So this would be served two roles. One is to greatly reduce the titer of the virus to reduce the lethality. A second is to buy us enough time so even um, a normal person can develop enough immunity to catch up in such an environment. And in particular, we look into uh, targeting many viruses, uh, coronaviruses. As you can see, the SARS-CoV-2 keep evolving and we already have many uh, variants here. And there are also other coronavirus. They enter the cells using different receptors. Regardless, after they get into the cells, they release their genome RNA and become a replication machine, copying machine to make many, many copies and ultimately destroy their target cell and release. And we think CRISPR is an interesting solution because it doesn't target the, the surface layer. Therefore, it can just become universal because it targets the inner layer because all the virus share a common mechanism. And particularly, we use the gut RNA to target the viral genome RNA, which also binds to the subgenomic uh, mRNAs to get rid of both protein production and also the genome RNA. It's actually a uh, two benefits there. So we hope that would work. And I want to show you some data here. And we designed many guide RNA to target to a particular gene named nucleocapsid, which is highly conserved. And we further defined a long epithelial cell culture um, delivered with CRISPR and in fact with SARS-CoV-2 virus. After one to three days, we measure how much virus still there. We hope nothing. And after one day, we saw uh, using a best guide, we see 96%. Using a pair guide, we see 97% inhibition, which is very efficient. This was the first test. Then we went on to test different variants of the coronavirus, of the SARS-CoV-2 here. Uh, so as you can see, they have very consistent high inhibition. Uh, I was really curious about the Delta virus strain, and as that was a big trouble these days. Unfortunately, our collaborator, Catherine Bleach, at here uh, is still working on culturing them, but we will, we will try to tell, uh, test on Delta virus soon. Um, but also, not only SARS-CoV-2, we also test other coronaviruses just using the same design. And again, we saw very strong inhibition, 97% using a single guide, or for OC43, we achieved even 99%. And I want to show you some, like seeing is believing, right? So when we not using a good guide, non-targeting guide, cells indeed died because red cells mean cells with CRISPR pigment, but green cells mean dead cells. And when we use a targeting guide, cell grow dense and no dead cells showed up as in four or five days, this is all live cell imaging. And not only that, the CRISPR allowed preventing us against multi-infection. 
for example, when we use two virus to infect the same cell at the same time, we actually see very strong inhibition on both. And both showed 99.46%, very exciting, which I don't think any uh, antiviral can easily do that because a lot of antiviral was highly specific. And furthermore, we combine this system with nebulizer, like to generate a mist. What we did for X vivo is we use this mist to get onto each well of the cells. So this mist only for 10 seconds, mimicking how we can breathe in um, this uh, inhaler system. And further, we use a, a patient derived uh, uh, long, uh, epithelial cells and uh, di differentiate into organelle, deliver them uh, with virus, and then using the uh, LMP mRNA to, to, to treat that and deliver efficiency into this epithelial culture is 62%, and we see a 92% reduction of viral infection after three days. And as a final data I'd like to share is, there are many ongoing work on defining small molecules, but they target very different pathways from the CRISPR. CRISPR degrades RNA, but they may block entry or block replication. So we hypothesize this, they may work together. And indeed, when we combine a uh, remdesivir analog, you know, which is an analog uh, for the nucleoside for RNA replication, when we combine them, while individual ones showed a hundredfold or two hundredfold inhibition, either by drug or by our pigment, combining them shows almost four logs of the reduction. And I talked with some virologists, and they believe three to four logs of reduction is important for initiating clinical trials. So we were also excited to see how synergistically they work together. And with this, I'd like to summarize my whole talk. I hope I explained the picture uh, that CRISPR has many species and we can harvest natural ones. We can also engineer new ones. And we can use them for many different functions from transcription to epigenome, to imaging, to 3D genome, to antiviral, and to some other interesting uh, developments. And this could fit into a big picture of the, of the genome. And Here's my favorite analogy. It's a Swiss Army life, and we need a toolkit, not just a single tool. With this, I'd like to thank the lab who really contributed to the progress and data, and our nice collaborators over the years to support supply knowledge that we didn't know at all, and also the funding from different agencies. And, with, and at the end, I'd like to really thank Dr. Thomas Hader and Mrs. Hader for sponsoring this, um, this a lecture, and this gave me an opportunity to talk about our work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chi, for such an excellent presentation. It certainly gives us a lot of hope for the future, and it opened doors to much needed therapeutics. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. David Lowe, Senior Associate Dean for Research, to facilitate the discussion or question answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Dees. Um, so if people want to ask questions, you could raise your hand or put something into the chat and, and I can um, really um, um, forward the questions here to, to Dr. Chi. Maybe let me start off with a question. Thank you for a great uh, lecture. It was really fun to watch all these tools and applying them. So I had a kind of a technical question is that um, it was interesting to hear the, you know, test comparing in vitro versus in vivo application. And so I wondered whether or not um, one of the uh, technical issues is like, if you were to try and enter this into more stably inherited or like even germline, could you potentially even make somebody genetically immune to, you know, every coronavirus. <laughs> is that, have you tested something like that, putting something into the germline? Uh, no, we, we, we haven't done that. Um, there is a big barrier for the ethical side about uh, performing editing in the germ cells of the human. And uh, as we still, there are a lot of things to understand how modifying a gene or a few genes will play a, a role in a long term of the human's life. And uh, it's not a best medical process to do that. And furthermore, uh, any mutations introduced could also be inherited by the, by the uh, offsprings of the 
of the individual. So that also creates a much longer influence on the human society. Uh, as such, the current gene editing technologies, mostly referring to somatic cell uh, engineering, because even in the worst case, something goes wrong, it only affects the individuals who receive this treatment, but it won't go too long into the, the later generations. Um, I think we still need years and years of work to fully understand the performance and the mapping of every single step of this type of system in the human body and also over decades of the, of the tracking to see what's happening before we can commit to germline editing. Thank you, that's a great, uh, great point to make. Um, here's, here's a question. Um, what made you want to go into genome engineering? I was, uh, when I first became uh, transferred from physics to biology, um, I was intrigued by DNA biology. And there are a lot of interesting knowledge. Actually, genetics, molecular biology is about biology of DNA. However, when we talk about the DNA inside the human cells, our knowledge is limited due to our incapability to modify them directly in the human cells. A lot of previous work needs to be performed in simpler organisms like yeast, or extract DNA out, modify them, study what's going on. So how can we really greatly accelerate the research by orders of magnitude require such tools? A second reason is my personal choice of the synthetic biology. As, as my understanding of the synthetic biology is how we can um, engineer functions into cells and create novel functions and study the whole cell as a system. That requires us to not only modify a single gene, but also control the genome as a network, as a program. And that requires different ways to control them. That, that further inspired our uh, interest to this DCAS system to control it rather than adding it. Thank you. So. Um, here's another question. Um, so the uh, engineered forms of these effector molecules, you have better the effective effector function in vivo and and you know longer duration. So is there a potential that over the longer period um, that there could be complications from the longer term effector activity? Um. In many cases, the effector is a transcriptional controller. Uh, our observation is uh, the effect will dissipate over time. So it actually does not create super long effect, uh, but that would be suitable for, let's say, stem cell differentiation because stem cell differentiation only occurs in a few weeks, not doesn't need to be years. Uh, but in terms of epigenome editing, for example, permanently modifying a demethylation mark to silence a crime team. And those may have long-term effects. And as the, the field of epigenetics trying to uh, answer the question like, oh yeah, what, what ha happens if we modify it over years and how that change the behavior of cells, how that change behavior of the organ? I think these tools should provide an entry point and uh, I will be very interested to learn about that biology first before claiming everything, anything here. Maybe I can ask a question in the opposite direction is that um, when you were describing what is essentially like in a molecular immunization, what would be the potential benefit long-term? I mean, would you need a booster inhalation of a mist every year, every six months, you know, that sort of thing. What, are the, what would be the persistence of the kind of molecular immunization? Um, I have to, uh, I have to see that, um, we imagine that the system is, it doesn't need to be used repeatedly again and again. It shouldn't become a daily use or weekly use. The reason is, uh, there is only a particular season of the infection that is very severe to the community. And, uh, the point is, uh, the patient, the person is exposed to the viral, uh, risk is only restricted to a period of time. If we can protect that period, that's probably enough. Second is um, our human immunity will kick in. For example, 
when virus infect our body and uh, in the early stage of infection, we use our inhaler system to get rid of the 99% of the viral load. That may buy us time for our immunity to develop, like antibodies can be generated. And while the patient will not suffer too much from a cytokine storm or from the, the bad damage from the viral infection, that is the concept here. Uh, in case of the flu, we actually also, I didn't show the data here, we also test it on influenza A, certain flus, uh, uh, it also worked. And in those cases, since the flu is not that lethal, we think this a smaller dose of this could become either prevention or become early stage treatment. Thanks. So you were talking earlier about reducing the size of the effector uh, Proteins, um, is there a theoretical uh, goal in terms of how truly small you can make the, uh, the CAS protein? Uh, a GFP is the size of one KB and the many genes is around the size of one KB. Um, I would be happier if the protein further become one KB. Of course, if it's even further smaller, um, sure, as long as the function is still there. Uh, smaller always have some benefits, but the, but, but the additional benefits introduced by becoming even smaller may, may dissipate quickly, depending on the need. For example, our current imagination of the Cas mini is because the protein is only 1.5 kb, AEV has 4.7 kb size. We still have 3 kb size, and we can encode a lot of other things <laughs> using the 3 kb. For example, putting additional gene or putting multiple guide RNAs to modify multiple genes. We, we do believe those are benefits, but if needed, we, uh, it's possible to make it even smaller because there's an even smaller CRISPR and also there are some other protein engineering can possibly do down there. Not, not to the point where you can synthesize some small organic, you know, you know cage or something like that. Anyway, <laughs> so um, I know this is a this is an ongoing um, question for everybody who who uses this. It's like, is it? Do you have a systematic way to design your guide RNAs? Um, when I first entered this CRISPR field, I admit that I overlooked the guide RNA design question. But the more I work in this field, the more I feel uh, core to protein engineering is your guide design. Human gene have so uh, there are so many genes, right? And, uh, and even on the same gene, there are so many sequences that 20 base pairs guide can bind to. And the number is just huge. But which guide would you use? Actually, is the major question determining success versus failures. Not only for editing, even more true for gene regulation. Because when we try to modify the epigenetic marks, DM isolation we need to target the enzyme to a region that the cell cares about. For example, a region, if we methylate, will have a function. Not a region, even if you methylate, doesn't ma matter, right? So that requires us to understand the epigenome landscape of the gene, of the, of the cell. Uh, for example, I will always use this example. Like when, cell, when people grow up, many people develop a lactose intolerance because there is a gene for metabolizing lactose, got epigenetic silence, right? If you want to activate that, we cannot just design a random guide to work. Very likely it doesn't work. We need methods to target to this gene to a region that cause its silencing and to reverse its effect. This can be done by sequencing and other people's database. And also there are emerging uh, computational tools to help your design life easier. It's not 100% accurate, but it's better than just gambling. Thanks. Um, I, I see two related questions here. One about, uh, it's basically, they're about delivery systems. So one was about specialized approach for this nebulizer. You showed that mist for, for lung delivery, but also let's say we're talking about um, delivering to tumor cells or other kinds of targets. Are, are, are you developing more specialized delivery systems for this kind of, um, um, therapeutic? Uh, right. Um, uh, not only us, but many labs are working on this, especially for delivery lab. For example, trying to engineer the surface protein of the uh, AAV uh, viral particle, we all steer it as preference. 
uh, for LMP, their pref preferred location is liver and uh, trying to detargeting the liver uh, to muscle, to brain may help their efficient delivery. And there is a second layer of the specificity, which is by using uh, cell type specific control elements. For example, a promoter that will only be turned on in the right type of cell, but not in the wrong type of cell. With those layers, we may also make sure even sometimes these particles go to a wrong, wrong type of cell, but they never expressing these gene editors, but only in the right type of cells, they will express the molecule and edit the genome or activate the gene. So these, uh, it will be interesting to continue to explore on that front. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I'm sure there's a lot of different companies eager to, to find nice technological solutions to that, to that question, so. Um, well, um, I think we're, we're, we're kind of um, toward the end of our time here. I, I um, thank you so much for your great answers to the, the thoughtful questions from our, our audience. Um, I don't know if there's any other um, comments or, or questions. Oh, here's a note. Oh, here's a quick, uh, uh, well, maybe, I don't know how quick. <laughs> so um, you did touch on this um, with some of the, uh, uh, attacking the chromatin and so on. Um, could you, do you have any other comments on how your toolkit to um, interact with the three-dimensional structure of the chromosomes to in, especially in this enhancer promoter interaction, you know, the folding of the, uh, of the chromosome and, and the activation of gene, regulation of genes. Any more comments on that? Yes. Um, in terms of this, this is actually a really important layer of the regulation happening inside, this, inside cells and also a unique power of CRISPR to target these enhancers on the promoters. And for people who are not starting genetics, promoters control genes, but enhancers is like a, 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 a fueling uh, like station for the promoter to work. These two need to come together to turn on the gene. And, and for us, we've been trying a few things. One is using the CRISPR silencing uh, we do find that simultaneously silencing both promoter and enhancer is the most effective way to silence the gene. If you only silence promoter, enhancer is still coming there, right? So it's still not completely silenced, but this uh, used as a technology. But in another case, we find that's become a method to probe the function of the enhancers. Because the, the, the fundamental question in enhancers is how do we know an enhancer is an enhancer? <laughs> and DNA may come close together, but they may not have the function. And by using the technology to probe them and measuring the outcome on gene regulation, we may indeed know not only these two, gene, two genes come together, but also they really have a functional output. So that's something that I'm very excited about. And I want to comment that CRISPR is, can be used as a very large scale technology to not only start a one site at a time, it can be used to start a tens of thousands of the genomic sites in parallel because designing guides and synthesizing guide is not a challenge, not a very challenging task these days. And in terms of starting enhancers, promoters, um, we do have work. Um, I haven't included the data to perturb tens of thousands of the sites for enhancers to probe which site is indeed an enhancer and what is their contribution. I hope to share the story in the future. So, so I guess the next step is to have artificial intelligence uh, design a whole pro program from out of, out of that, right? <laughs> if we have enough data, yes. Machine yeah. learning and uh, big data would be helpful to predict so that will save a lot of time and money to perform my lab experiments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Okay, well, well, thank you so much. This has really been a great discussion. Um, maybe I'll hand that this back to Dean Deese and and uh, or or Dr. Heider to to maybe um, thank you again and and close out the session. Again, um, Dr. Chi, uh, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. It leaves us with a lot to think about. And I know that many of the biomedical um, science faculty are here, and we are going to be contacting you and hopefully opening a path for some collaboration 
in the future. And we look forward to having you here at UCR School of Medicine in person. And um, Dr. Heider, would you like to say a few words before we end? Sure, this was a wonderful talk. It wants me to go back to graduate school, Dr. Chi. That this is such an exciting time and, and, and you gave it in such a concise way in such an understandable way. What a, it's a great topic, but very difficult, but you made it so clear that I, I hope everybody that watched this understood it. I know I did and, and I'm sure from the way the presentation was that everybody uh, connects with it in, in one way or another. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dean uh, Dees, and also Dr. Thomas uh, Heider. Yeah, it's actually our hope that uh, some of these tools will someday no longer just be a research tool, but also really change people's lives and bring hope to some challenging disease. And that actually is the ultimate goal, hopefully soon, but in the next 10 years, hopefully. Well, thanks everyone for attending and more to come next year. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs>